According to Schellenberg's argument from divine hiddenness, a non-resistant non-believer is simply put, somebody who fails to believe in God in such a way that the failure is not itself the result of resistant self-deception. A key premise of the divine hiddenness argument just is the claim that such persons exist or have existed in the past. For most people, this premise will appear obvious, and this appearance likely the result of their connections and communications with other people, people they know and understand, people they trust, people they respect. On the other hand, some claim to be skeptical of this premise. Can we really know that these non-believers aren't resisting? To answer these questions, we've got to take a closer look at Schellenberg's concept of non-resistant non-belief. Before addressing the non-resistant forms of non-belief, what is non-belief more generally? This can seem like a dumb question, but it's important for establishing something, namely the fact that the tent of non-belief is a very big tent. See, many are or may be tempted to equate non-belief with atheism, where atheism in this context is understood as believing that God does not exist. But defining non-belief so narrowly that it includes only atheists would be a mistake. After all, agnostics fit comfortably within the tent of non-belief. But the tent is even larger than that. We can think of non-belief as coming in two broad varieties. On the one hand, we could talk about reflective non-believers. For Schellenberg, reflective non-believers are individuals who disbelieve or are in doubt about the concept of God as a result of reflection on its content and some attempt to discover whether the proposition God exists is true or false. Clarifying the distinction between disbelief and what Schellenberg means by doubt, he continues, quote, those who disbelieve consider this proposition to be improbable or certainly false and so believe that God does not exist. Individuals who are in doubt, on the other hand, are uncertain about the truth of this proposition, believing neither God exists or God does not exist, typically as a consequence of believing that epistemic parity obtains between God exists and its denial. So again, under the heading of reflective non-believers, Schellenberg places disbelief, atheists, and doubters, agnostics. Of course, not all non-belief is reflective. Some people fail to believe in God, not as a result of reflection on the idea of God, but because they've never really considered the concept of God in the first place. An individual may be somewhat aware of the concept of God and may even be familiar with some people who believe in it, but from the perspective of their own community and the epistemic authorities therein, they might find it so implausible that they don't feel any real curiosity toward it. They may never feel inclined to seek out clear articulations of and or arguments for the existence of God. To them, it's just the cultural noise of some people over there. But this lack of consideration or reflection can occur in another way too. For example, it could be the result of their never having the concept of God in the first place. After all, how can one consider the content of the concept of God, let alone consider whether such a person exists if one has yet to acquire the concept? So again, contrasting it with the reflective non-belief of the atheist or agnostic, unreflective non-believers are so named because their failure to believe in God is not the result of their thinking about the content of the claim that God exists and trying to find out whether it is a true description of the world. So that's non-belief in general, but what about resistant non-belief in particular? When Schellenberg initially developed the argument, he referred to reasonable non-belief, which meant blameless or inculpable non-belief. He has since come to prefer a more specific species within inculpable non-belief, namely non-resistant non-belief. And as mentioned, these are instances of non-belief that are not the result of resistance. But to get a grasp on what is meant by this, it might help to see what Schellenberg says about how resistance of a certain type could possibly cause non-belief. In his 2015 book, The Hiddenness Argument, Philosophy's New Challenge to Belief in God, Schellenberg writes, quote, The self-deceptive resistance required would include a desire component, a desire not to be in a relationship with God, or else to be in a condition incompatible with relationship with God. 
We might imagine a resistor wanting to do her own thing without considering God's view on the matter, or wanting to do something she regards as in fact contrary to the values cultivated in a relationship with God. Schellenberg continues, quote, But it would also involve actions or omissions, at least mental ones, in support of such a desire. Actions or omissions which have the result that, self-deceived, one no longer believes in the existence of God, although one did to begin with. Here we might imagine careless investigation of one sort or another in relation to the existence of God, or someone deliberately consorting with people who carelessly fail to believe in God and avoiding those who believe, or just, over time, mentally drifting with her own acquiescence away from any place where she could convincingly be met by evidence of God. Now, I want to pause here to make two points. First, according to the account of rationality that Schellenberg adopts, at least the one in his 1993 book, an account that he gets from Swinburne, by the way, a person is only culpable in her failure to believe something if they have knowingly failed to meet their epistemic obligations in relation to that proposition. So when Schellenberg talks about resistance, he's talking about intentional actions or omissions of epistemic negligence. He's talking about willfully closing your eyes to what you believed to be the case prior to the act. That's why he's talking about self-deception here. The second point I want to mention here is that resistance to God, as Schellenberg outlines it, is not merely an act contrary to what God would want or a foolish or presumptive attitude on the part of the creature about their preferred role in a relationship with God. After all, these are things that can be accommodated by God within a dynamically developing and improving creature-creator relationship, and so do not constitute a reason for an unsurpassably loving God to be closed to relationship with his created persons. Moreover, we can see that this is the shape of a relationship, a dynamically developing and improving one that a perfectly rational God would want, at least in those worlds where he intentionally creates creatures that are morally immature, relationally immature, and rationally immature. No, resistance involves more than a bad attitude. It requires actions or omissions that press toward specifically self-deception, resulting in the individual closing their eyes to God's light, thereby causing their lack of belief. Now, in his 2007 book, Wisdom to Doubt, A Justification for Religious Skepticism, Schellenberg attends to four situations that describe the lives of people. The motivation for picking them is that they appear to be clear cases of non-resistant non-belief. The four examples he gives are former believers, lifelong seekers, converts to non-theistic religions, and isolated non-theists. So, first up are former believers. These are persons who having been raised in a religious household or community, have dedicated their lives so far to following the God they believe exists. Consider the inner lives of such people. Some of them have, within that context, come to value and appreciate the challenge and the calling of self-denial, of conforming their will to what they understood God's will to be, and to doing so at great inconvenience and sacrifice. Such persons feel right at home in a world where a loving God exists and enjoy what they perceive as a deep relationship with the creator of the universe. Moreover, this belief is the cornerstone of their most valued relationships. Their friends, their family, indeed their entire social structure is unified in part by their love of God. Despite this, some of these persons discovered their belief in God fading and sometimes even completely disappearing. It is important to note that this loss is not a willed loss. Rather, these moments of loss are experienced as a, a kind of death and very often require a period of mourning. This can and does lead to periods of depression. To them, the world has become a darker place. It's not something they wished for or sought out, but what's interesting here is that if we feel entitled to infer a self-deceptive resistance in these people, it's going to be a resistance to the perceived death of their relationship with God rather than the other way around. I've lost track of the number of people I've met who have lost their faith in the most inconvenient of times. 
Next, we have lifelong seekers. These are persons who have, for their entire lives, sought out the ultimate with an openness toward whatever form that it may take. Their unbelief is a kind of reflective metaphysical groping in the dark, and that groping was supposed to be temporary. They've opened their minds with the purpose of closing it on the truth, but have perpetually failed to find an answer. The issue here is that if the truth is ultimism personified, we should expect their openness to be met with belief in God. But of course, it very often is not. And we might also talk about converts to non-theistic religions. Such people are either reflective or unreflective non-believers whose lack of belief in God is the result of them investigating and judging as correct some religious claims that are incompatible with theism. Schellenberg writes, quote, Such individuals would honestly take themselves to have found a truth that in fact only enmeshed them in a meaning system distortive of what must, if God exists, be the truth. The last alleged type of non-resistant non-belief worth mentioning here is the kind of non-belief that results from never having the concept of a robust monotheistic God in the first place. Schellenberg calls them isolated non-theists, and that isolation can be an intellectual one, it can be a geographic one. That there are or have been persons who lacked any concept of full robust monotheism is not really a matter of serious debate within cognitive science of religion. In at least this sense, then, the existence of this kind of non-resistant non-belief is not a matter of serious debate. More on that in the next episode. Okay, so we have, in this episode, looked deeper at the work of J.L. Schellenberg to see just what is meant by his phrase non-resistant non-believer in order to anticipate objections to the premise which alleges their existence. This was supplemented by a brief survey of commonplace and plausible cases of non-resistant non-belief. And in the next episode, we're going to look further on those examples in conjunction with some additional arguments to make the case that non-resistant non-belief actually exists. Thanks for watching. Uh, please hit like and subscribe to keep up with future content. Music is by Casserole, a Chicago-based band and used with permission. If you appreciate the content and the tone of what Real A Theology has to offer, please take just a moment and leave a review on iTunes. It's easy to do and it really helps with visibility. You can support us directly by making a small recurring donation to our Patreon for early access to our content. Comments, questions, criticisms, or requests can be sent in audio form to realatheology at gmail.com for possible inclusion in future episodes. Special thanks to our patrons, Charles Hoffer, Tyler Bimrose, Jason, Robin Willems, Ed Atkinson, Kim Bushkovsky, Anthony Lawson, Jeff Rubinoff, and Brandon McCleary. <laughs>